All right. My name is Peter Biondo from the Spring Fling Bracket Races, and I'm joined today by the multi-time NHRA world champion, Dan Fletcher. Dan, what's going on? What's up, Pedro? How are you? Doing, doing well, buddy. Doing well, getting uh, getting ready for the events. And uh, you just came off a foot, big foot break win. Well, you won't call it a big win, but you uh, I heard you had numbers that were top bulb like. Uh, so uh, pretty good start to the year for you. Yeah, could be worse. It's nice to win something. I uh, don't seem to win as much as I used to anymore. It's gotten a lot harder. We all know that. But uh, no, it's fun. Galat's only 33 miles from the house. Greatest little track in the world. Looking forward to uh, being able to race there more this year and running the fling there in another another few weeks. I won't be making Vegas, but I wasn't invited, so I'm not going. Well, I beg to differ. I heard there's an open <laughs> spot in the Domino trailer. <laughs> well, yeah, that's kind of right outside. I guess I could go, but yeah. <laughs> I need, as Brad Plowger would say when he left Gainesville, I need to make a good adult decision here. So that's what I'm trying to do. All right. Well, listen, you're an adult. Well, uh, I still think uh, you should pack it in, put your big boy pants on and let's strap it down in a trailer and let's do it. In my weaker moments, I considered it, believe me. I mean, it's a pretty good opportunity and obviously it's a great race and I'd like to go, but the two week commitment with driving out there and back and just they got a lot of stuff going on here, have two dogs and a cat to watch. So I'm, I'm home on a puppy patrol. All right. Well, there's going to be a lot of racers that aren't going to be disappointed that you're not there. <laughs> um, the um, Tell us the story. I'm always intrigued and I think our audience would be intrigued. Tell us the story about call a spade a spade, how you were miserable working your nine to five at Xerox and you took a huge risk with a family. And I believe you had young kids at the time and uh, decided to roll the dice uh, without any um designated income unless you want to race uh tell us that story and uh what was that 93 um i actually walked out of xerox for the last time in 97 but i basically was there part-time whether they knew it or not from probably about 94 on um yeah just you know typical guy that didn't like his nine to five just uh you know clearing paper jams and writing reports about a paper tray handling and dog ears on corners of papers just really wasn't, wasn't my thing. Um, it didn't, you know, back then it was what, I mean, God, it's almost 30 years ago. You know, I mean, I made a decent living there as an engineering technician and, you know, it was a warm in the winter and cool in the summer. It wasn't terrible, but you know, I had aspirations to be a racer guy and that back in the day, you could make $20,000 in a national event or damn near 20 grand. And it looked like a very winnable bottom ball bracket race. And that was kind of what I was good at. If you know, I was good at anything was, you know, trans break bottom ball seemed like a doable deal. Back in the day, you would turn your nose up at IHRA races that paid like 10 grand. Um, NHRA was a better part of 20, but there was a lot of opportunity. And you could, again, back in the day, you could count on winning class at a couple races and you could, you know, make, the better part of a grand Tim Warner used to make 1500 winning class and class actually meant something back in the day. So I just, I looked at it and laid out a business plan. And I felt like if I went to, you know, six, eight, 10 of those NHRA races a year that, I mean, I got to be able to win one or two. And if I went to, you know, three or four IHRA races, if I could win one of them, some round money, so a couple class wins, a divisional win, I just, I could put together, my God, if I can't gross 60 grand and not spend that much and be as, uh, as ahead as I am at Xerox, I, I just thought it would work. I mean, I really did. And I felt like I was killing every day of my life walking into Xerox. I mean, you're only going to be alive so long. Like I just saw on the Google snaps today that everyone's good friend and announcer guy, Bob Uncafer and He's not doing good. I mean, and it doesn't look like he's going to probably make it through. And it's super sad, dude. I mean, Tim Warner passed away back in December. You aren't going to be alive forever. So you got to got to kind of do what makes you happy. And I'm not saying they're working on race cars like I do these days makes you too happy. But, you know, it's still better than Xerox. That's for sure. So you had kids at the time. Yeah. Yeah. I had a 
Thomas and uh, let's see, Timbo was born in '95. So yeah, but it's not. Well, they actually the way you know it's a different world now. I mean, guys get maternity leave all the time, right? But <clears throat> back in the day, when Taylor was born, and uh, pardon me, Timbo was born in '92. I don't believe I just said that. Taylor was born in '95. So Taylor's born in December of 95. Right about that time is when they had came out with a deal called the Family and Medical Leave Act, F FMLA or whatever. And basically I took it as 13 weeks of unpaid leave, maternity leave for a guy. So Taylor's born in December. You know, she's born, whatever, you know, go back to work. Well, I walked into my boss and say, I don't know, May-ish, whatever probably before the Western swing walked into my boss and said, hi boss, I'm going to do this family medical leave act. I'm out of here for 13 weeks. <laughs> so he wasn't too happy, but it was, you know, I wasn't getting paid for it. I think you might even get paid at this point, but it was unpaid leave and it was my dry run to go out there and see if I can make this work. We went on the Western swing. Um, I think we did as I recall it, but I know that I won Brainerd. And I won an IHRA national event in Scribner. So between those two, I grossed about 30, probably hit a points meter. So, I mean, and it was like, after I came back, if you want, I, dude, I can do this. <laughs> this can work, you know? So I went back to work after that point. I, I tried to make an adult decision. <laughs> I went back to work, worked through the winter, you know, worked through the fall and the winter, whatever 13 weeks I ended up, went back to work, worked at Xerox all that spring, started out the year out west. And I won, you know, at this point, you know, I'm flying back and forth or, you know, however I did it, but I won, I think like Phoenix and Gainesville to start the year. And I wasn't planning on walking out of Xerox for good until like June. And after Gainesville, I just called up and says, <laughs> I'm out. <laughs> thanks. Thanks for coming. I won't be back. So that's how yeah, it went. And, and as, as a racer, you know, um, I know you can run, you can drive good under pressure. I mean, you, you and I have been rivals turned into good friends now, but back in the day, sometimes we wouldn't even look at each other in the stage lanes. We were pretty intense competitors. Mm -hmm. um, and I always thought you had a great knack for racing under pressure, but um, man, what was it like? Uh, how does that change your approach to a round? I'm sure there's sleepless nights going up to it, but you start the, you start the year, let's say in a slump, and you got to put food on the table. Uh, does it, did it help you or hurt you performance in a race car? I got to tell you the truth. It really had like no impact. I mean, I would, uh, it honestly got it had no impact. And, and when I walked out of Xerox, there was no touch. I had no sponsors, zero. I had an orange Camaro. <laughs> I had nothing. I had my dad's 77 Dodge van <laughs> and, and a beat up old. Hi. Oh, hi, mommy. Hi. <laughs> I had a beat up, beat up old and closed trailer. I had a, my dad's Dodge van, my dad's, my, the beat up and closed trailer was actually one of the barn doors and ramps. I mean, that's how old it was. Um, so in an orange Camaro, dude, I had no sponsor dollars. So I had to make it all happen on the track. You know, fortunately, Valvoline stepped up not long after I walked out of Xerox as my first primary sponsor. And that helped out at the time I thought, it was the greatest thing in the world. I got like a thousand dollars a race or something, you know, for a national event deal up to 15 races. I mean, obviously that wouldn't hardly get a man to Vegas and back at this point, but uh, like Bertozzi, Anthony said, you know, that he, you know, I can't believe you can even stage a car. You know I mean? That you got to win to feed your kids and ball. Dude, the minute I would, and I'm not, I'm not BSing when I say this, when I, when I would start the car, I mean, sure, my nuts were in a vice all week or something. I mean, if, 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 you know, I knew I was close to, but at the time you didn't need to make that much. Life was simpler. The mortgage is small, <laughs> no car payments. You know, I mean, the overhead was down, you know, things didn't cost what they cost. Now you didn't have to make that much, you know, but when I fired a car to go into water, there's nothing else other than what's ahead of me. And it just, it never really affected me. Sure. When I would leave after I lost and now I'm like, I didn't win and I don't know how I'm going to pay the rent this month. Yeah. Then the drive home was pretty rugged, you know, but I had raced that whole way when I was a kid, when I was 18, 19, 20, I didn't have the money to go do it. 
I had to win. <laughs> you know, if I didn't win, I couldn't afford to go do it. It's it just it's the way it's always been. So that's not really ever changed. And unfortunately, well, I guess things have changed now. Now when the win light comes on in the final, it's about just satisfaction that I won. But 15 years ago, it was, okay, there's another month's worth of money. <laughs> you know, that's what the win light in the final meant. But now it's with sponsor dollars, I mean, it's gone inverse. You know, I used to have no sponsors and have to win a bunch. And now it's, you know, I'm blessed to have micro strategies and ATI and VP and Denzo and Mickey Thompson. You know, it just, if I didn't have them, I couldn't do it now because you can't win enough. And you, I can't A, win physically enough races and you can't make enough money. So if it wasn't for sponsors, forget it. So there's my deal. Yeah, that's, and I've watched it play out over the decades. Uh, so now I'm 51 years old. You're a few years older. What are you, 56, five? Yeah, I like your thinking. You're close. Okay, I'm close. <laughs> Mid-50s. Um, yeah. I mean, so I can't help to a- but ask, because this is starting to, I've never thought like this before, but now I get to a race, you see a lot of young guys. I used to hear my father talking about this and think he was crazy, but you start to wonder when you're not going to be able to compete at the level that you and I hold ourselves to a, right. to a high standard. Um, I mean, you see people in all kinds of sports. You see Tom Brady, who's, uh, who's coming back at it again. Um, like, wh- where do you see it ending and, like, how? Yeah. Well, let's face it. You know, careers never really end well, right? I mean, you generally – you know, you know, you've got to hit a rusty Wallace wall, right? Where you're incompetent before you finally recognize it's time to hang it up. I'd like to think I'm going to be smart enough to, to realize or be a realist enough to realize. I, I think that I'm, I think that I'm still very, very good at what I do, but I will say that I, I make some mistakes that I don't think I should make that I might not have made before. My friend, again, Tim Warner used to say that, as you get older, it's harder to concentrate. You're up there, you know, you're up there staging and not that your mind wanders per se, but you're noticing that golf cart on the return road that's driving by. <laughs> you know, you can't, you've got to have a level of focus where you aren't seeing any of that. And I don't want to be that guy, you know, with a friggin' little peephole, you know, in my in my <laughs> shield or something, you know. Who was the guy from back in the day Rarity and Bob with a paper towel tube? Your dad used to, <laughs> <laughs> your father was telling that story. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't want to think that my focus is so bad that I need that kind of crutch, you know, but yeah, if we, if we get, if I start seeing you with a paper, with a, uh, toilet paper hole, paper <laughs> towel hole, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to flag you down and say, I think it might be time to hang it up, Dan. <laughs> I think you're you, right. I think There's you a, lot do of, it. a lot of young kids out there, a lot of talented young guys. It's hard for me to believe like there's some kid there the other day talking to me, whatever. And, you know, I find out from Timothy that he might, he's like 23 or four years old. I'm thinking, my God, I'm over 30 years older than this guy, <laughs> you know? And I, I just like, like the old guy, oh, ugh, like the old timers always used to tell us, right. You don't, you still think that you're 20, but then you're back and your legs tell you you aren't. But when you're out there racing, you still think that you're just as young as them. But when I went to a bracket race with, with the guys at Pittsburgh a couple of years ago, the one guy said, oh, you brought Pops with you. What, what the F? I'm Pops now? I'm the old guy? Yeah, that's what <laughs> happens. I'm, I'm the old guy now. <laughs> and I'm not really down with that, but that's just the way it is, right? Yeah, it, it happens fast, and I agree with you 100%. You, you're, you tell yourself one thing, but your body tells yourself another. Yeah. Um, so what's, uh, give us one thing. Let's say you're transitioning out of races, out of racing, and you have Tim, your son, uh, Timothy. Let's say, and you have taken him under your wing, and you have one piece of advice to give him, just one. What would it be? Um, uh, just one. It, just one's hard, but just discipline. Just discipline. That's that's it. All facets of life, discipline. That that's a good way of putting it, because uh, you can relate discipline to all facets of racing and of life. Um, 
So where do you see uh, you have any? I mean, how many world championships have you won? And and and, and you won 102 I, national events, right? Yeah, I've, I've 105 tied Manzo last year at Charlotte. That's by the way, that's <clears throat> a huge deal right there. 105 yeah. NHRA national events. Yeah. But go ahead. Uh, yeah. But it's not near as easy to win them now as it was. <laughs> um, I've won three championships, but I haven't raced for points in, you know, really in like over 10 years, probably. I mean, the divisional events aren't that lucrative. Although <laughs> divisional events used to pay like 3,500, four grand, and nationals paid like 20. And now divisional events still pay like 3,500, four grand, and the national events like nine. So divisional event is really a, a lot more appealing than it used to be, right? So I might have to start going to a few more of those, especially I'm only a half hour from Galat, I'm only two hours from Rockingham, two hours from BMP. You know, I mean, I can probably hit a few more where it might make sense. It, it didn't used to make sense to go spend the same amount of money, the same assets, the same. That's one problem is Brecker is, yes, I want to go out this weekend, but I made 20 runs on my equipment. Like Stenna would say, to double honor, you got to hate your equipment, right? <laughs> I, dude, I made 20 runs. Kyle's dad used to budget, right? Exactly how many dollars per run it would be. And it yep. used to be like $20 a run. I can't imagine what it is now. I lost money. I won. I lost. <laughs> well, and, and for you, for the audience that doesn't know Dan as well as I do, Dan's a, I mean, he's very articulate. He's very, um, he looks at all of the angles when he makes a decision on what to race, what class to race, what combination to build. Um, with all of that said, he chooses a 4,000 pound station wagon <laughs> to run into the spring flings, um, which I still shake my head. And I have shaken my head for a while about it until I raced with you uh, down in Montgomery at Brits race. And I saw how that thing printed tickets, but it's pretty ironic that, you have a dragster, you have a lot of good cars, and you pick a 4,000-pound station wagon. Can you, uh, can you tell us why? Um, it's a super fun car to drive. I mean, really fun. It's got personality, right? I mean, it's. I think wagons are cool. I like wagons. And it's, <clears throat> it's an easy car to drive. It's just a super easy car to drive. And it's... I'm not like bragging or anything, but I'll put that car up against anyone's car, dude. I mean, it really runs good and it stops like a son of a bitch. I mean, I'm, I know where my spot is and it, it, it's just a really good car and it's super fun. And unlike a dragster, that's just a giant pain in the butt to load and unload. And, you know, if it's raining, you get caught in the rain, the trailers have you jacked them out in the air, get the nose off of it. You know, just wagon, just, it's very comfortable. It's very, and if if it was comfortable and not good, that would be one thing, but it's, it's pretty good. I mean, I, I know that everyone probably chuckles. They all got real race cars that are $80,000 cars. And I got this old street car, but <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not afraid to go try with it. You know? No, I, I think it's great. Um, Dan Fletcher, gas or alcohol? <laughs> I'm, again, I'm different than a lot, right? I'm gas. I, my kids always wanted alcohol and, I'm just not down with the whole alcohol deal and the problem set that comes with it. And I think a good gas setup is, you know, it might move just a little where alcohol's maybe not gonna, I guess. But again, like Pete Dagnall is a super great racer, hard worker, pretty smart, works hard on his stuff to make it better. And he runs on alcohol and he's been with us with the Nova and the wagon. And, you know, I think he'd tell you that it's, you know, pretty, pretty damn good. So I'm a gas guy. I, I don't have, when you bring two cars and you go for these long races, I don't have enough room for that much alcohol. <laughs> well, let, let's, uh, let's close it out with, do you have one story from the races? What's your most embarrassing story at the racetrack? <laughs> Dude, I can't pick one. I got lots of embarrassing stories. <laughs> I, so, okay. You could pick where, you know, I fall off the top of my motorhome. <laughs> where I ran my scooter into a fence, where I ran my scooter into the guardrail at the end of the track, where I, I, I just, there's a million, but probably one of my most embarrassing on track races is I'm at Gainesville and I'm running uh, Bo Kinney, who is Cambria's friend that I sold one of my old race cars to. 
So just that's kind of funny, right? Poor Paul Cambria, an attorney, you know, got some money, whatever, good guy, wanted to get into racing. I sold him my LT1 Firebird. Well, that I've probably cost that guy $5 million with all the race. He's got two Copos and just all, yeah, I mean, the amount of money that, well, then he drug his buddy Bo Kenny into it. And he had all kinds. Of, so I'm running Bo Kenny. Bo was a great guy, probably not the best racer in the world. And uh, he was having problems with his GT car at Gainesville and someone to transmission or whatever. I got to, I think it was probably the thousand foot. I can't believe I'd do it earlier than that, but I got to the thousand foot and he's like, you know, 18 bus lengths behind me had a problem with the transmission again. And I threw the freaking car in neutral. i like, I would in a, in a time run where I'm shutting it off at a thousand and here he comes and I'm in neutral. And I can't, I believe I, I had to have almost thrown a neutral at the eighth mile. <laughs> I mean, but the bottom line is I watched him drive by me first round at Gainesville and I lived at home in New York, right? So you're 20 hours from home. And I watched him drive by me and turn a wind light on and then be broke and not be able to go up for the next round. Cause I threw the frigging car in neutral, just complete brain cramp. Yeah. That might be one of my most embarrassing on track efforts. What's crazy about that story is not only do I remember it, but I'm pretty sure I was happy that it happened because I had a bye run next round. Uh, I'm pretty sure if we look into the archives, I was I ran both Kenny that next round. Uh, yeah, I I don't recall that, but that would make it just all the gooder. Sure. Well, Dan, we appreciate you coming on. Uh, wish you the best of luck in 2022.